ASMR channel where every week I whisper to you, the viewer, the listener, about a different horror movie that I love. Today's film is 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula. That's a lot of apostrophes when I put the year in front of it like that. I'm really excited to talk about this one because as a kid, this was sort of an aspirational movie for me to see. The road toward finally getting to see it was long and troubled. Not troubled, <laughs> not really. This came out in November 1992. I distinctly remember we were visiting my aunt, my aunt Lori, in Sanibel Island, Florida, where she lived. We were going down there for Thanksgiving, and I think at that point, Dracula had been out for a few weeks, so it was getting a lot of hype. It was a very divisive movie in some ways, which we'll talk about, but it was a huge box office success, and I felt like, imagistically, it was iconic right off the bat. Even if you hadn't seen the movie, you saw Gary Oldman with the big Buffon <laughs> hairstyle. The movie is a very, very elaborate, distinct visual identity, and I think that was in the cultural lexicon right from the get-go. I remember there was the Simpsons episode that parodied it, uh, the Halloween Treehouse of Horror special. That, that year right away was making fun of it. I feel like when something is getting made fun of a lot or satirized or parodied by other pieces of pop culture, then you know it's a hit. <laughs> you know that people are paying attention to it. And Dracula was very much like that, regardless of one's own feelings toward the movie. So we're in Sanibel Island. I was a little kid who loved horror movies. And I really, really wanted to see it. And... On Thanksgiving weekend, the Disney film Aladdin came out, and so I remember my parents and my aunt, my uncle, and the whole family went to the movies in Santa Blanca Island, Florida, and naturally the kids all had to go see Aladdin, and the adults all got to go see Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, I love Aladdin. I had no problem seeing Aladdin. It's a great movie. It's a great Disney movie, but... Once again, you're a little kid, you're a little kid who loves horror movies, you're a little kid who's maybe only allowed to see a certain kind of horror movie that has a certain kind of rating attached to it, and Dracula was rated R, so I did not get to go with my parents to see it. Afterward, their opinions were pretty mixed about it, and as I said, this was a divisive film because it's so weird, because it's so distinct. Francis Ford Coppola, when he was directing the film and they were in pre-production and doing designs, he literally used the word weird. He wanted the designs to look weird. He didn't want them to look typical of a vampire movie, a horror movie, of any kind of movie. And overall, I think the eccentric style of the movie, this almost melodramatic, over-the-top, theatrical, gothic style of the movie threw a lot of people off at the time. Maybe didn't throw them off, but they just didn't like it. I re remember my parents distinctly talking about how good Gary Oldman was as Dracula and how bad Keanu Reeves was as Jonathan Harker, which I disagree with. And they... I think their favorite part of the movie was Anthony Hopkins as Professor Abraham Van Helsing, the world-famous vampire killer. So, when this movie came out, in the horror community, it got a lot of publicity because it was being marketed as one of the few true-to-the-novel adaptations of Dracula. If you look at all the famous adaptations over the years, the Hammer films with Christopher Lee, the Frank Langella film, which I, I love both those adaptations, Nosferatu, none of them stayed especially true to Bram Stoker's original novel. The 
version that really made Dracula famous on the silver screen was the Universal Pictures Dracula with Bela Lugosi. Now what people always associate with that film, and I would say with Dracula as a whole, is the really <laughs> hammy Transylvanian accent, the slick back hair with the widow's beak, the black cape, the very the you know, pale face, the ears, all that. Now, that film was actually based on a, a popular stage adaptation of Dracula that was very big on Broadway back then, and because of the limitations of the stage, they had to change a lot from the book. Um, there's all sorts of weird things in that adaptation. They kind of combined the roles of Renfield and Harker. They changed names. They, they change what Dracula is. So if you're a fan of the book, and I certainly am, there's no sort of romance attached to Dracula as a character. He's more of a parasite. He just wants to suck the power and the life and the essence out of everything he touches. He's, I mean, he's a sociopath. He's not some endoomed kind of romantic. If there's any kind of attraction to women in the novel, it's almost predatory. It's not this, oh, you're my long-lost love kind of thing. So this Dracula comes out, and it's, once again, being hailed as one of the first films that includes the character of Quincy Morris, who is one of... Lucy Western as suitors. She has these three suitors who, who want to marry her, and a lot of the times they consolidate those characters or get rid of one of them. It was praised as the first movie to add that. The first movie that was really doing Van Helsing, right? That was going to have Dracula have all his powers that he does in the novel. I feel like we always associate him with sucking blood and turning into a bat, but in the novel he turns into a wolf. He turns into mist. He turns into a bat. He can do all of these things. And this film adaptation, Bram Stoker's Dracula, under Francis Ford Coppola's direction, it does really address all of those things and return some things to the story that were originally omitted or changed. Another big change that happened a lot over the years in some of the other adaptations that is that they would swap the characters of Mina and Lucy. So Lucy would be the one who was engaged to Jonathan Harker, or would be the main object of uh, Dra Dracula's sights rather than Mina. So just a lot of kind of convoluted mythology over the years, and this movie does correct that. But the reason my dad had a particular problem with this movie was that they still retained this romance angle, this idea that Mina is not just some target for Dracula. She is the incarnation of his long-lost love, which is kind of a trope that it just really been in the Dracula franchise or the Dracula story for a long time at that point, even though it's not in the book at all. He does go after Mina, but it's not romantic. Like I said, he's a predator. He's a parasite. Now, I'm of two minds of this. At the, on one end, I'm with my dad. And I'm like, well, that seems like a big thing to add for an adaptation that's supposed to be really true to the novel. On the other hand... I don't know, people love romance. It does up the stakes a little bit for Jonathan Harker's story, who is her her fiancé, who is the first one to encounter Dracula. And I actually like, as I get older, I really like the way they handle that subplot in the film. But it is funny because I, I think the tagline of this movie on the poster was something similar to Love Never Dies or Love is Immortal. So it is funny to take the one big thing that's not in the novel and make that the whole marketing campaign and the sort of core of the story. But I do think it's done quite beautifully. And at the end of the day, going back to, the, to this visual style that the film has, it's a very romantic movie. And by romantic, I don't mean sweet, lovey-dovey. I mean romantic in the historical sense. It's from the romantic period. Everything is really over-the-top and elegant and there's a little bit of a realism to the time period when they're walking on the streets of London. It you know, looks like Victorian London, Elizabethan London. I don't know. Yeah, Victorian London. Sorry, I'm getting my time periods mixed up. Um, but at the same time, when you look at Dracula's fashion, yeah, he has almost, it's like mixed with this kimono, which feels very Japanese. But then in the beginning, when we see him as this 
Romanian soldier, Transylvanian so soldier who is fighting for Christianity. He's dressed in this armor that almost looks like something out of a Batman comic. <laughs> I don't think, as far as I know, I during the Crusades or whatever battle it is, I don't think people wore armor like that. Maybe I'm wrong. So even though some of the films, I would say the more traditional British aspects of it, of traditional British society, look pretty realistic to the time, you know, the top hats, the overcoats, all that, although that looks somewhat antiquarian and actually true to the time period, there are a lot of elements that are, once again, coming from Francis Ford Coppola's uh, direction to his designers to just make it weird, and when I think about the film in those terms, the romance definitely has a place in it. Everything feels over the top and not in a campy way, in a very gothic, romantic kind of way. And let's talk about how that relates to the acting style a little bit. Um, Keanu Reeves, even by, by people who loved the movie, just got massacred in the press when this came out. People thought his acting was stilted. They didn't like his British accent. And maybe that's true. Maybe his accent work is not great. I don't know. But I actually quite enjoy his performance in this because of the way he looks. He has that kind of wide-eyed, innocent thing going on, which really plays well. Because once again, he's the first person to encounter Dracula in the story. So when all this wild stuff starts happening to him, I feel like he actually radiates fright. And the idea of being corrupted really well. And on a much more superficial level, like I said, this is not a realistic movie. I don't think it calls for realistic acting. If you look at Anthony Hopkins in the film as Van Helsing, he's great, but he's going so over the top that it almost matches up with what Keanu Reeves is doing, with what Gary Oldman's doing. Everyone is just operating at an 11 <laughs> in this, and that is fine by me. I... I'm a big fan of when films value a singular aesthetic over being hyper-realistic. Hyper-realistic horror movies can be really cool too, but in a film that's about a guy who has survived for hundreds of years and thinks his long-lost love is resurrected and he can shapeshift and it's a, the movie also takes place centuries ago. I don't know, I don't necessarily need something completely realistic. I like that this movie is stylized. Horror, to me, is a genre that really benefits from having a genre within a genre. So a lot of these films, they have their own visual identity. I think I talked about, way back on the first episode, how in the Halloween films, at least the first Halloween film, Michael Myers almost, when he moves the light, with him, so when he's standing and looking out someone's window, or in, into someone's window, he's almost lit like you would like light a play. It's not the natural light. The natural light would just be pitch darkness. We're almost seeing this ghostly light that travels with him. And I feel the same way about Bram Stoker's Dracula. If you look at the lighting in this movie, it, and maybe it's just because I'm a theater guy, so I'm I'm always going to think everything <laughs> looks like a play, but the lights in this film, they really do look like a play. There are points when, I'm thinking, for instance, when Jonathan Harker gets attacked by Dracula's brides, and Dracula sees it, and he cackles at it, and this red light emanates on his face from underneath, and the screen actually almost does like a Looney Tunes thing, where it closes into a circle until it goes to black. There's nothing realistic about that. That's an effect. The lighting is like an effect you would use in theater where you have very isolated light coming from a very specific direction. And that transition almost looks old time. You like something you would see in a silent film. And Francis Ford Coppola has given interviews where he's talked about how he wanted to use technology that felt a little outdated, that felt maybe of the period when this movie was supposed to take place in. And then it's this interesting effect of, in, in a way, by using some of the technology that was popular then, so theatrical lighting, these strange, almost silent film transitions, in doing that and pulling from the thing that actually did exist when this film takes place, 
which you could argue is somewhat realistic, he's actually creating this very unrealistic effect, which makes the feel, film feel very dreamlike at certain points, and then very nightmarish at other points. Another uh, image that really comes to mind is when we we see the battle between the Christians and the, the Muslims, the Turkish people, in the beginning of this, and later on when Dracula and Mina are traveling around the London streets, and they go into this kind of, it's almost like a World's Fair exhibition with, uh, with all these new technologies. He sees kind of like a shadow puppet version of that fight. I love that. I love that we got to see this in real time. And then we see a very stilted, fake-looking representation of it. All of it just really ties together nicely for me, which is why some of the campier acting choices are the more over-the-top acting choices. I think feel very natural in this movie. I mean, you have Tom Waits <laughs> playing Renfield. Uh, Tom Waits, who is a, a one of my favorite musicians, but completely over-the-top in everything he does. If you're looking at early career Tom Waits, so this was one you I think was on Island Records, and he was playing more of the jazzy, drunk at the piano, late night, cocktail, scuzz, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it was a little bit more scaled back and not as eccentric or carnival-like as his later work, but it it still wasn't especially realistic. He was singing these very over-the-top tales about street life and this very over-the-top language. He was playing a character. And then later on, he pivoted to doing this kind of dark carnival thing, whatever you want to call it, with albums like Rain Dogs and Mule Variations and Swordfish Trombones. So you have him playing Renfield, and he is fantastic as Renfield, but it's Tom Waits. Once again, not hyper-realistic. The guy is almost playing a cartoon character and eating bugs and whatnot. I would say the most naturalistic performance is honestly probably from Winona Ryder as Mina and Sadie Frost as Lucy. But I think because they're being sought after by Dracula because he is just zooming in on them, that works well too because they're the people who are at the center of the danger in the movie. And unlike Harker, who is going to a new place and encountering Dracula, they are in their familiar home and having Dracula descend on them. So I kind of enjoy that their acting style is a little bit more stripped down and realistic. We should talk about the visual effects in this movie. We've talked about the design, but this is where I think the movie actually feels rather frightening. It's not a movie that I watch and get scared of in the way that I get scared of Halloween. When I, If I watch Dracula then go out for a walk at night, I'm not shaking in my boots or anything like that. There aren't jump scares. There aren't even scares that really have to do with the periphery. For me, it's almost what I would call a magnificent kind of horror. The kind of horror that happens and I'm almost just in awe of it and enchanted by it, much like you would probably be by a vampire in real life. When Mina sees Dracula in his wolf form copulating with Lucy in the garden, it's not scary from a uh, ah, oh, it's a werewolf, but it's more like, oh my god, what is going on? It's it's both enchanting but revolting at the same time. And I think that's because the makeup effects are, are so effective. And the film does a really good job of, no matter what Gary Oldman is transforming into his Dracula, you can see Gary Oldman beneath, beneath, the, beneath the layers of makeup. Um, they almost set up this base foundation, which is like a slightly made-up Gary Oldman that comes through everything. So if you look at the face of the werewolf in this, and the face of the bat, and the face of Gary Oldman as an aged Dracula, they all have a similar kind of a nose. It's almost these like slits for nostrils, and this sag, these sagging jowls. He has this kind of facade. You know what it's like? If any of you are fans of the book It by Stephen King, whenever Pennywise transforms, you can always still see certain calling cards on his form. So you might see an orange puff from his clown suit or a shock of red hair or something like that. Dracula's almost 
like that in this. There's there's always just a little bit of Gary Oldman creeping through it, which I love and helps the film retain some nice humanity. My favorite effect in the film is when the vampire hunters all burst in on Mina being seduced by Dracula and drinking the blood from his chest. And he looks at them and he transforms into this giant bat creature. It almost looks like From Dusk Till Dawn, or I should say From Dusk Till Dawn almost looks like that, um, because From Dusk Till Dawn came out a few years later, but I'm a huge fan of just big, gnarly prosthetics, and I like how in this, he doesn't shrink into a little cartoon bat like he does in so many of the other films. He becomes this big, disgusting, human-sized bat creature. It's wild. I might be wrong. I feel like that's maybe the first vampire movie that did something like that. I know that Fright Night has some really cool, they don't do the traditional looking bat, they almost do a little goblin-y looking Jim Henson Muppet bat, but I think, I could be wrong, let me know if I am, I think this is the first film where they really do this man bat, this creature bat, and you just see it for a split second, and then he backs into the shadows, and you can see just see his eyes still, you just see his red eyes, and in the shadows, when he steps back out, he is suddenly a bunch of rats together, but in the form of the bat, and then the rats collapse and, and scurry out, it's, it's just a really, really cool effect, um, <laughs> this is a bit of a tangent, but, uh, I have a friend, a, a close friend who, in college, would, um, if he had had a few drinks, and he would meet people at a party. He loves this movie, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> and people would ask him where he was from, you know, what his background was, what his parents did. And he would just give details about this movie. So he, he would say, oh yeah, my, you know, my father was a, a werewolf and he would drift over the countryside in a blue mist, but he would say it really dryly and really realistically and very convincingly and not, I'm, I'm not doing it justice, he wouldn't say all the details up front like that, he would just kind of pepper these things into the, the conversation to see if people caught on and I always thought that, that was really funny I realized I never said, uh, I never talked about when I actually got to see this movie for the first time, so I mentioned how us kids all had to go to Aladdin, my parents had to go, they got to go to Dracula, and I kind of heard their varying reports on it, how they were really drawn to certain things in the movie, but then really turned off by some of the other things in the movie, and in a weird way, that made me want to see it more, because I wanted to develop my own opinion, and I think sometimes when you hear polarized, different opinions of a film, you have no idea what it's going to be like. It almost makes it more surprising and interesting as opposed to a film that everyone hates or everyone's raving about. The film does have a pretty good deal of nudity in it, and it's pretty violent, so I actually don't think I, I, I got to see it in full until a couple years later when I was 10 or 11. But at the time, Topps Comics put out a, I want to say it was a four, or six issue adaptation of the movie that's very close to the screenplay all the dialogue and it comes right from it and the artwork was from Mike Mignola who I would really come to love later on for his comic book Hellboy I love Mike Mignola's artwork sometimes when they do film adaptations or uh, comic book adaptations of a, a film that just came out I feel like they may be <laughs> Not that the artist isn't good, but they don't really get an artist that can capture, truly capture the vibe of the film. I remember there was a comic book adaptation in the magazine Heavy Metal of the film Alien, back when Alien came out. I wasn't alive, but I read it later. And it's accurate. It, it is Alien, but the artwork is just a little too in your face. It shows a little too much. It looks a little too comic booky for a movie that really gets a lot of mileage out of not showing the creature or gradually showing the creature in different forms and so sometimes comic book adaptations can be a little bit disappointing but Mike Mignola and I don't know how well known he was at that point I, I mean he hadn't done Hellboy I don't think so I, I don't think he was that famous but Mike Mignola was an excellent fit for a Dracula comic book because 
because as I said, this film, even though it's elegant and beautiful and lush and vivid, it does rely a lot on shadows. And when I think of Mike Mignola's artwork, he really relies on shadow. I mean, I feel like so many of his great drawings of Hellboy villains will be them half in shadow. And maybe you just see an eye gleaming out of the darkness on the side, and then you see all their features right here. So I actually feel like he really captured the essence of this film quite well. And for scenes like the, the bat scene, the bat fading into the shadows and turning into a bunch of rats, he was really able to nail that on the page while also putting his own spin on it. So even though I wasn't allowed to see the movie at the time, I was allowed to read this <laughs> Topps Comics adaptation of Dracula. And that's a pretty good representation of the movie. You know, it, it didn't show full-on nudity, and it wasn't quite as bloody, but once I saw the film, and I loved the film, I was like, yeah, I actually think I had a pretty decent idea of what this movie looked like because of that comic book adaptation that, that I got when the film came out. But it was weird. I, I said earlier that the movie was aspirational for me in, in seeing it, and it really was because... It was this gradual build-up. It was, first I heard all the hype about the movie. Then I heard my parents' varying opinions on the movie. Then I saw the Simpsons spoof it. And then I read the comic book. And then I finally got to see it myself. And then over the years, I think the film has taken on quite a legacy. I, I feel like sometimes people, when they rewatch it, they do make fun of it a little bit now because it is so over-the-top. But I... I will always be a defender of it because, as I said, I really respect when a film leans into its visual style. When Francis Ford Coppola, who, I mean, let's face it, the guy's a visionary. I know he's got some not amazing films, but I think we forget how experimental he really was. Even in something like the Godfather films, which have, you know, come to be in these blockbuster classics, when you look at some of the techniques he was using in that movie and how he was portraying mafia life. I mean, it was revolutionary for the time, and it was strange for the time. The reason that films like The Godfather in the 70s, these Paramount, you know, Robert Evans produced pictures or whatever, the reason that Art House almost became blockbuster in the 70s was because of people like Francis Ford Coppola, because they found a way to distill experimentation and mainstream taste into this weird combination. And I think Dracula actually does that. I think maybe the reason people have a little bit of a harder time swallowing it than something like The Godfather, which I would argue is, is just as stylistically strange, or Apocalypse Now, or you know, any of his other great films. I think the reason people sometimes like to give this movie a lot of flag is because it's a horror film, because it's about vampires. So often people are not willing to suspend their disbelief or even just be open-minded when it comes to storytelling in the horror genre. For instance, I may have talked about this in the Halloween episode, but when I showed Halloween to some friends for the first time, a lot of them just couldn't get past the fact that Laurie keeps dropping the knife at the end, which is very silly to me because, and, and sorry, I, I feel like I might be repeating myself, but you might be asleep anyway, <laughs> but A, you don't know what you would, how you would be reacting if, if a serial killer was coming after you, and if you would be in a good headspace or not, or even a survivalist headspace, you might drop the knife too, and also it's just not an interesting criticism to me it's not an interesting way to look at a horror movie i guess you could watch dracula and make fun of keanu reeves acting but i feel like there are better conversations to be had and i i don't want to sound cranky i don't want to sound like everyone needs to love Bram Stoker's dracula or any movie for that matter but i do think when it comes to discourse and film criticism especially with horror movies we get a little bit too concerned with reality when at the end of the day no movie is really realistic i mean every movie even the most realistic movie is still i don't even want to call it a replica of reality it's a 
it's almost a fractured view of reality. It's taking people and having everyone pretend to build something and then putting it on a screen. And if you hold that side by side to real life, that's not what it looks like. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is to me, the act of making a film is an act of stylization and it's an act of trying to capture reality through in, in what can be a very abstract lens. And when I say capture reality, to me, that doesn't mean, oh, we're, it's got to be cinema verite and just we can't use any effects or anything like that. When I think of capturing reality, I'm more thinking about capturing how it feels to be a human being or simply just capturing a story that is exciting and is going to make me feel something when I watch it. And to me, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula checks all those boxes. I feel like that's a little bit of a soapbox I'm getting on, but I, I do think sometimes when I debate with people about films, it always comes back to, well, it wouldn't happen like that in real life. His accent wouldn't be like that in real life. That boat wouldn't look like that in real life. That makeup wouldn't look like that in real life. And I just think they're, like I said, they're more compelling conversations to be had. I don't know if I'm making any kind of sense right now. This is all just kind of coming off the top of my head, but when I think about Bram Stoker's Dracula, Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula, and why I love the film, it's because it transports me to another plane, it transports me to a place that doesn't look like the world that I'm in, a place where there are vampires, <laughs> and people who can turn to wolves, and all the other greatness that comes with this film. I'm thinking about that the opening sequence, or not the opening opening, but one of the opening sequences when Keanu Reeves is Jonathan Harker, he's waiting for this carriage to pick him up to go to Dracula's castle, and the door opens, and this long arm extends out, and I don't know what the effect is, but it, it almost looks like the arm changes size as it grabs him into the carriage, and I think that's why I like this movie as symbolized by like a three second shot it's this thing of it's kind of real and then reality gets distorted but not enough to where you would question it if that makes sense Jonathan Harker is he knows something is up but he's not going to question any of it until it gets way too late and things get way more in his face I don't know at this point I feel like I'm just kind of rambling a little bit although point of view is smart is to ramble right one final thing i would like to touch on about this film and i think it's because i don't see it a lot in contemporary films is so in the beginning in this prelude where we see dracula when he's a human before he's a vampire fighting the turks and defending christianity and all that so he's dracula obviously winona Ryder is who plays mina is playing his wife who kills herself Elizabeth or Elizabeth and Anthony Hopkins who plays Van Helsing he's playing this priest so you're you're kind of having characters from the contemporary narrative play people in the past narrative or the alternative narrative and when I think about that it reminds me of the Wizard of Oz how when Dorothy goes to Oz the witch is played by the same actress who plays Miss Gulch the cowardly lion the Tin man the scarecrow played by the guys who played the farmhands uh the wizard is played by that traveling um medicine show guy from the beginning they do that peter pan a lot too i feel like the actor who plays the dad usually also plays captain hook eventually or if you, it's hook the steven spielberg film uh dustin hoffman who plays captain hook he plays the voice of the uh pilot when they go to london I don't see that a lot in modern movies anymore, this idea of mirror casting something, of, of like blatantly casting the same person in one role, um, and then putting them in another role, and having those two things be in conversation with each other or reflect each other. Let me know if you can think of a recent film that does that. Honestly, the only one that's coming to mind for me is Transformers The Last Night. The f I think that's the fifth Transformers film. It's pretty horrible. I like Transformers a lot, but oof, that is a hard series to get through. I like the old show a lot and the uh, 
uh, old animated film that I really like, Bumblebee, which came out a few years ago. Um, but the Michael Bay ones, uh, after the first one, and even the first one is not perfect, about far from perfect, they just become really incomprehensible. But in that fifth film, I think Stanley Tucci, honestly, I can't even remember who he plays in, in the, the modern world, but he plays Merlin as in King Arthur's Merlin in the the prologue and hey Anthony Hopkins is in that film too um I would say check it out but it's I don't think it's very very good maybe we'll do a a, a Transformers slightly smart at some point um it's not a horror movie but maybe we'll run out of horror movies I don't know anyway I feel like I'm going off with a lot of tangents on this episode but maybe that's okay maybe you enjoy that kind of thing as always thanks for watching I hope everything is well in your corner of the world. Um, I know I keep saying this, but, uh, you know, vaccines are a thing now. I was actually able to sign up for uh, one today because I'm, I'm doing some teaching. Um, and I felt really good. I felt ecstatic about that. So I, I hope if, if you're looking to get a vaccine, I hope you're able to do it with just as much ease. And if you haven't, I'm, I'm hoping you're able to do so soon. Um, I really am seeing a light at the end of the tunnel for this very awful situation we've all been in for the over a year now um and i'm really excited to be able to do go see a movie in a theater go see a play uh whenever plays do happen again um so yeah i hope you're safe i hope things are going well uh and if they're not that's all right too as i said i'm always going to be honest with your feelings also too i know i haven't really had a regular schedule these past couple weeks i, I think my last video came out on i want to say a wednesday or something and this one's coming out on a, maybe a monday or tuesday um I've, I've been freelancing a lot which is good i'm very lucky to have work right now um between teen between uh teaching playwriting and writing gigs and everything like that's great but my schedules just become a little bit erratic so it's hard for me to find a consistent time each week um i'm gonna work to try and get back to that but things are just a little back and forth right now as they are for a lot of people so thanks for your patience as i slowly get back into this and uh work toward having a, a more consistent schedule so thanks for watching i will definitely see you next week um per someone's comment i i have a movie in mind that will tie to an upcoming holiday let's just say that but it's a movie i've never seen I don't know if it's going to be good. I've heard not great things about it. So this will be a me watching it for the first time. I, I'm trying to think. I don't think I've done a film that I've never seen before. So that could be cool. Me watching it for the first time, not knowing at all what to expect. Um, but that will be the next film we do. So keep a lookout for that. Until then, hope you're well. Hope you're safe get some sleep, don't have any nightmares, except for the good kind. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.